Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the San Francisco Roundtable Round Table Technical Working Group. I would like to call this meeting to order of the May 16, 2023 SFO Community Roundtable Technical Group at 3.32 p.m. We are meeting in person at the Foster City Council Chambers Conference Room and virtually via Zoom. And joining us today are staff of the Roundtable, Kathleen Wentworth, Roundtable Coordinator, and Angela Montez, Roundtable Administrative Secretary. We we'll also have with us Bert Ganong, San Francisco Airport Aircraft Noise Office Manager, as well as Paul Hanna, Consultant Chief Airspace and Flight Operation Engineer for SFO. Kathleen, I'm going to turn it over to you if there's anyone that you need to acknowledge or recognize. Joining us today is Paul Wold, our Roundtable Representative from the City of Woodside. And um, from the County De uh, De Deputy Chief Director of the Planning and Building Department for the counties, Lisa Ayazaza. And did we say hello to Joe Bird officially from the FAA? Hey, of course. Welcome, Joe. Thank you. Welcome, everyone, as a matter of fact. Thank, Thank you. you all for joining us. Oh, it's Linda Wollen. Yeah. Oh, and I'm sorry, I've told when Linda Wollen is also with us today. Okay. Welcome, Linda. Excellent. All right. Is that it? I think so. Thank okay. you so much, Kathy. And of course, thing had to join from as well. Okay. Great. Welcome. Welcome. Okay, wonderful. Uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and move to roll call, Kathleen, please. Uh, so for roll call, we have Chair Sam Hindi. Here. Member Judith Pasco. Uh, member Terry O'Connell. Here. And member Ricardo Ortiz. So we are still not quite a quorum. Okay, uh, while we are doing so, I'm going to go ahead and start by doing make a, a announcing land acknowledgement. And I would like to acknowledge that we are on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Remitash Ohlone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards of this land and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramitesh Ohlone have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretaker of this place, as well as for all the people who reside in their traditional territory. As guests, we recognize, or I recognize, that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. I wish to pay my, my respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramitesh community, past, present, and future, and by affirming their sovereign rights as first people. Uh, with that, so Kathleen, I think we're going to go ahead and proceed, even though we do not have a quorum, we do not have any action items on the agenda today. Yes, sir. Hopefully, the other members will join us. Uh, we're going to move on to public comments. Next item on the agenda. This is a time for members of the public who would like to speak on an item that is not an agenda. This would be the time to do so. Uh, I don't see anyone present here with us from the public. If, is there anyone on Zoom, uh, Ms. Montez? Yes, Chairman, thank you. And for the record, I would like to note that uh, Member Schneider has joined us from the city of Mulberry. Welcome, Member Schneider. And for those attending the meeting on the Zoom video conference, we will use the raise hand feature in order to organize any public comments. During the general public comment period and for each item on the regular agenda, I will ask those members of the public who wish to comment to click the raise hand feature to speak on that agenda item. For those joining by phone, please press star nine to indicate your desire to speak. When you hear your name called, I will prompt you to unmute your microphone and inform you that you may begin speaking. You will have two minutes. And I do see two hands raised, so I will first call on Jennifer Landisman, followed by Mark Schultz. Ms. Landisman? Thank you. Um, good afternoon. I first wanted to thank Chair Hindi and the FAA for providing a response to public comment regarding FAA processes um, for procedures design, um, GBAS, as regards public involvement and NEPA review. These continue to be a big source of community concern um, and about what changes could be ahead and how they would impact um, different communities. Um, I did send a written public comment today about uh, the what I think is a very arbitrary or sort of mysterious way of going about uh, soliciting and receiving proposals via SFO. And I made the suggestion that it would be very helpful to have a report 
a summary report in this process ongoing with A, all the proposals you received, why they were accepted, why they were not accepted, how they relate to prior efforts to address noise. This would be very helpful from a historical perspective instead of reinventing the wheel. And I wonder if an effort was made to look at proposals which the FAA has solicited before during the select committee, for example. And I added a, what I think happen to think is a very a game changing proposal, the title for some of the GBAS proposals, which is the full length of the bay solution. And I provide, provided just a few of the supporting documents for this idea that was presented to the FAA pre-select committee, during the select committee. And um, the way citizens approached it was pretty thoughtful. Uh, we didn't just look at what would be happening to one community. First, we looked at how it would reduce noise for all residential areas and also looked at things in terms of time, fuel cost, and all sorts of these variables, which I think should be considered when you present all of these procedures. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Landisman. And for the record, Chairman, I would also like to note that Vice Chair Royce has joined the meeting. Thank you. Welcome, Vice Chair Royce. I will now call on Mr. Marshall. Hi, thank you. I just wanted to share a couple of things. Um, several of us who were in the a and &E, uh, conference were able to visit uh, NorCal TRACON, which I think was quite interesting. Um, learned a couple of things. One is they are aware that energy is too high as planes exit the surface structure at eddy, which of course, as we've talked about, creates requires you know aggressive flap settings and speed brakes in the sense that surfer is kind of out of criteria from an energy perspective. Uh, apparently, they've had similar problems on some of the Oakland arrivals, and they've been working on that, um, and that potentially uh, they'll be working on Surfer. Uh, that's not official or anything like that, but that seemed to be a possibility. They also noted that um, pilots really don't like the uh, the teardrop. Well, they first of all, Tracon did seem to like the RNP to GLS uh, teardrop. Uh, the Bodega, the uh, Bay arrival on uh, Bodega, which is great to hear, but they currently don't like the current down the Bay because their flight management systems default to the West uh, Bodega arrival. They didn't say why, although if you look at the arrival chart, it's pretty clear uh, when you get to the end of Bodega, it basically says track on 140, which sends them to the right. Um, I, you know, I don't know what the problem is, but as I said, what currently happens is they have to override the FMS to basically take the arrival over the bay rather than down the peninsula. Hopefully that's something that can be addressed in, in the future. Uh, all in all, I just want to say it really, uh, visiting Tracon was very, very informative. Uh, they were quite uh, great hosts and I think we all appreciate it very much. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Scholl. And with that, Chairman, we have no further comments. Thank you, Ms. Montes. Moving on to the regular agenda. Item number one on the agenda is we have with us, as you know, the GBAS team continues to work towards implementation of future quieter flight approach procedures for SFO. Over the past few years, we have heard many presentations from the SFO GBAS team. But as we will be asked to review more complex proposed procedure, it seems, at least to me and staff, I believe as well, that it'd be a good idea to get into the nuts and bolts of these community packets to understand fully the details in them and how these details can help us better understand the potential impact, whether beneficial or otherwise, to our residents. The first part of this will be the tutorial from Mr. Paul Hanna. Paul, we really appreciate you taking the time and help us get a uh, you know, get a really good hold on this and getting better understanding so we could continue to engage with you and with your team to be a, uh, to provide better input. Uh, so I really appreciate you doing that. And I hope, uh, Mr. Hanna, that you'll be okay with taking questions from roundtable members as we go along and on a rather informal basis, if you like. So I'm going to let the members of the roundtable just please just Raise your hand and let us know that you would like to ask a question and we have to put you in if that's okay with you, Paul. 
Absolutely. Always a privilege to, to be here. And thank you all for, for spending some of your afternoon uh, talking about the GBAS project with us. So, um, Chair Hindi, I had one favor to ask if I could. Um, there have been some recent developments or, or changes with the timeline for our Group 1 Innovative Procedures. And I've got just a very short um, a, a set of uh, materials that I'd like to present just to make sure everybody's kept in the loop about what those changes are and what it's going to mean before we get into the Community Flight Procedure Packages. Would it be okay if I just took maybe five or six minutes to go over that before we jump in? Absolutely. Let me just go set up the second part, and then I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, as far as that's, thank you so much, Paul. As far as the second part, uh, after Paul has completed the tutorial, we will uh, will be for roundtable members to ask other specific or clarifying questions to help better understand the process and outcomes. So, Paul, all yours. Go ahead and update us on what you have, and then of course take us to the tutorial. Okay, thank you so much, Chair Hindi, and and again, thank you everybody. I'm going to share my screen. I've got uh, a couple of things that we'll be sharing here today. So, first and foremost, as I mentioned, I've got. Um, I have quite a bit in, the, in this PowerPoint presentation, but I'm, I'm really going to be focusing, as you, you pointed out, more on the, um, uh, the community flight procedure packages today and, and helping everybody, I, I hope, uh, get a good understanding of what kind of information that we've placed into those community flight procedure packages. And then also a little bit of insight about what we put up on the noise.flysfo.com website to help uh, dive into that same information in a little bit more detail. Um, so the 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 one thing that I want to get out of the way right away first is the updated timeline for our Group One and our Group Two A uh, GLS procedures. Um, as and then we'll spend you know the the majority of our time here today talking about the Group Two A procedure CFPPs. And if there's time at the end, we'll we'll review our next steps. But I think most of our next steps are going to come out um, as we're talking about the CFPPs themselves. Um, so I've got a, a familiar looking slide, I hope at this point. Um, one of the big changes for those of you that haven't memorized every bubble and every you know chart or line on this particular slide is that um, what you will notice is that the group one innovative approach development that is currently underway by the FAA has been delayed until the end of the first quarter of 2024. Um, we had been, uh, you know, the Obviously, there's a lot of procedures that we're hoping to get um, developed and, and go through the environmental analysis, um, you know, based on the roundtable's recommendations, you know, well over a year ago at this point. Originally, we had been hoping that those were going to come out in November um, of this year. And then there were some small challenges related to approaches to the tens. Um, that we're potentially going to delay just those approaches until maybe the January timeframe. Um, but what's happened with uh, the most recent uh, development spike that's going on is that um, all of the Group 1 procedures are going to be published in late March of 2024. Um, so a little, um, uh, you know, less than a year away, um, but but a little bit later, I think, than we were expecting. And what that means is um, that is going to delay, of course, our uh, ability to go out and deploy our portable noise monitors to start um, trying to collect noise-related information from aircraft that are flying those innovative Group 1 GLS procedures. Um, and then it's also going to have a knock-on effect of delaying our first um, GBAS portable noise monitoring report. So um, that's that's the big important thing that I wanted to point out right away, is to say that the Group 1 innovative approaches are delayed until March of 24. And we would expect that um, our noise monitoring reports would come out um, just a few months after um, that point at which the the Group One GLS procedures are published and the aircraft start flying them. So it could be um, it could be closer to maybe um, you know May potentially um, or June before we have our first kind of published quarterly noise monitoring report that comes out. Um, you know, previewing some of the information about aircraft that are flying those innovative procedures. We are still attempting to um, work with groups uh, like the technical working group here for the SFO roundtable and other cities and uh, the noise forum. Um, on the east side of the bay to evaluate our group 2A innovative approach procedures. And we're trying to wrap up that evaluation to the best of our ability by the end of this year so that we can um, find out which procedures the community uh, believes are the best to take forward for the FAA to begin development. Um, and if we hold to that timeline, we would expect those procedures to, to potentially start coming into existence in the 2026 time period. Um, but of course, you know, we're, we're still getting new suggested procedures to review even today. Uh, we discovered we had some new ideas and we're going to do our best to take those back to our uh, flight procedure subcommittee and see if any of those 
um, can fit within the GBAS project for group 2A and, and potentially get converted into CFPPs. So again, I'm just gonna show these very, very quickly. Um, you heard me talk about approaches to the tens. Um, we had a GLS approach to 10 left and a GLS approach to 10 right. Both of those were part of the group one set. Um, those procedures um, are, are such a, a, a kind of good path, so to speak, uh, in terms of the um, getting a precision approach to runway 10 left and 10 right for the first time. Um, and of course, getting a precision approach to those runways means that we're reducing the likelihood of an aircraft not being able to see the runway and having to go around. Um, it also provides you know, a better stabilized approach course for a lot of aircraft that find themselves having to make that landing on the tens. It's a rare occasion, of course, this year it happened more than I think everybody wanted. Um, so we're really excited to try to get these GLS procedures up there. Um, the FAA, uh, you know, in reviewing those GLS procedures has decided that they would also like to modify all the other existing approaches to 10 left and 10 right to match the GLS approaches. And so what you're seeing on the screen here comes from the gateway. And we're anticipating that um, not only the GLS procedures, the new ones to 10 left and 10 right will be published March 21st, but the other three approaches that are out there will all be amended to follow the same path. Um, to come into the runway. So, so that's coming for 21 March 24. Um, the other group one procedures to runways 28 right and 28 left, as I mentioned, are going to be um, published March 21st of 2024, with one exception, um, which has not yet been published to the gateway. And this is for the GLS uniform. Um, many of you uh, know this approach procedure as maybe the GLS Romeo. It, it was intended as a lateral overlay of the RNP Yankee approach that exists today to runway 28 right. Um, this is one of the existing approaches that takes aircraft out over the bay before um, they kind of come back in to make the landing on 28 right. Um, this has been an important approach for us because um, we are using it as the basis for comparison with two of our CFPPs that we're going to talk about here today. So one of the interesting challenges for us here is, um, again, the GLS uniform is a, it's a complicated approach procedure to convert into GLS. It's currently RMP today, which has certain flexibility of criteria that the FAA is using to maximum advantage. And to convert that, um, that kind of very curved approach into a GLS approach meant that some of the waypoints had to get tweaked just a little bit. Um, and in an effort to get all those waypoints uh, moved to just the right places, um, it turns out that the RNP Yankee is going to need to also get slightly modified so that it matches the GLS uniform uh, laterally. The GLS uniform will, of course, have slightly higher minimum altitudes in the areas over, uh, first, you know, over Eddie and Sideby. Um, so they won't be completely identical, but they'll be, they'll be very similar. Um, so that change, um, because the RMP Yankee needs to change at the same time that the GLS uniform does, that one procedure is getting popped out to a different timeline. So we're not going to delay all the group one procedures, but we do need to delay that one. Um, and it's now targeting the 26th of December, 2024. Um, so those were the, the timeline changes that I just wanted to point out very quickly. I want to pause there before I get to the community flight procedure packages. Does anybody have any questions? You're the chair member, Terry. Yeah. Um, when you say that the FAA wants to uh, standardize all the procedures to match the GLS approaches, would that mean that any community input on whether the GLS approach is effective would be out of off the table because all the procedures would be matching? Does that make it, sense? It, in, I, I think I understand your question. And, and just to be super clear, and I'm sorry if I, I didn't uh, state it clearly the first time, the area where the FAA has expressed an interest to make sure the procedures match is to the tens. Um, and in that, it, it, there is this separate issue for GLS uniform. Uh, I'll talk about that one separately. But for the tens, um, it, it's... Uh, Having the, the fewest number of, of waypoints in the area where the aircraft are going to make these, these uh, occasional landings is really important for the safety of air traffic and the air traffic controllers and the crews. Um, so the, so the, the notion here was to try to get them all to match up so that there weren't you know 10 or 15 extra waypoints that were difficult to discern um, you know, when the air traffic controllers are trying to make sure that an aircraft is actually on the GLS to 10 left or, or 10 right. So in this area, um, 
and again, these are these are really rarely used procedures. Um, that that was the the notion that was taken by you know FA NAC and our, our subcommittee members. If there was um, strong public opinion um, to not go forward with this particular path. Um, because the procedures are currently under development by the FA, those comments would have to be passed back uh, through the standard NEPA process, I believe, to uh, like Joe Burt and his team. And um, Joe, uh, just, just to make sure I'm, I'm kind of echoing that the right way, am I, because these procedures are under development, is that where the public would leave their feedback if they didn't like this change? I would recommend that they send it to the roundtable and the roundtable draft a letter um, to the regional administrator. Oh, thank you for the clarification, Joe. I, uh, I'm glad. I... <laughs> you don't want that email directly? I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I, I mean, it, it, it may or may not fall under NEPA, depending on what level of NEPA there is. Um, so I don't want to point people in, into the NEPA avenue when it's, it may not actually be there. So the better place would be to um, submit comments either to the roundtable or um, to the regional administrator on your thoughts on these procedures. Just to be clear, I'm going to interject there with your permission. This is only for existing procedures, is that correct? Is that the way where we public will contact the roundtable? We're not talking about new procedures, we're talking about the modification of the existing procedure? Correct. We're talking about the modifications of the, the existing tens and then the GLS, I'm assuming they're overlays uh, or will be overlays when we make the modification. That's correct, Joe. Yeah. Okay. So it wouldn't be a modification that was being handled due to GLS, but GLS would be able to suck the data and guide them in under GLS instead of just coming in under the standard approach. Um, yeah, I'm going to say no, but I'll let Paul answer. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I yeah, I, I, I think I agree, Joe. I, I think, you know, in this particular situation, the GLS approaches that were designed and put out as community flight procedure packages, and they're, they're still up on the website. Um, the approach for 10 left and 10 right, um, they had to be offset to get aircraft as close to the runways as the GBAS could get us. Um, and it, it's a terrain challenge. It's nothing else. Um, so, so you, you know, you got the extended runway center line, and then we, we took those procedures and we went three degrees to the left. So uh, in some cases, it's a couple hundred feet, you know, north of the center line. I think at the worst case, it's maybe a quarter of a mile to a half mile or something like that um, off of the center line. So slight difference. Um, we did have some purple areas in our community flight procedures, which meant that our calculated noise was potentially going to increase for, for people living on the north side of the center line versus the south side. Um, um, but we were just looking at those GOS procedures. And in an average year, um, there, there are almost no approaches to the tens, which I think was a, an important deciding factor uh, for the situation. That's also one of the reasons why we understand some of our flight procedure subcommittee participants, FAA, NATCA, airlines, were very interested in getting the other RNAV GPS and RNAV RMP approaches to match the GLS approaches because the approaches are flown so infrequently that it was very cumbersome and potentially challenging to have lots of different paths to get to the runways out there. Um, so they, they wanted to just standardize them all and they and there was a hope, I believe, um, that that because the, the community felt that the GLS path to 10 left and tire was okay, that um, perhaps the RNAV GPS and RNAV RMP could, could seek the same path. Again, very, very low utilization um, anticipated, but um, I, I don't know if I'm giving you more information that you, than you wanted, Member O'Connell, or uh, uh, from getting closer to answering your question. I think to, to kind of add to what Paul said, they're basically modifying the existing RNAVs to match what they designed under the GLS. And just to be clear, those, those approaches or those uh, procedures for the tens are only during inclement weather and such a situation or... When one is then being used, yeah. winds out of the east. Okay. Yeah, winds. I think winds drive that more than anything. Yes. So it's reverse flow. That when you're under reverse flow, correct. Right. It's even more tricky than that because you know, <laughs> would we tennis call reverse flow, or do we have a different category for that? Yeah. I mean, usually we land on one yeah. nine. We yeah. think of as reverse well, flow typically, yeah. but this is even a more uncommon approach. 
that other than the past very wet winter we had, um, most pilots don't see a runway 10 landing, but a handful of times in their career, they're very uncommon. And this is when they're coming in over Millbrae? No, that's even less that's common. That's the one. That's the one. <laughs> that's yes. the one. Okay. So, so, so the other ten, end of the 2 8. Yes. Okay. Reverse gap. Yeah. Okay. Is so they're right? coming in over the hill there a little bit, and it's, it's a trick. Oh, right. Well, we okay. All right. Yeah, it's on that very first so slide. Really, there's a good picture. Is there a good picture on the first slide? The very first slide that you can show. Well, we have the, uh, the overview of the air show. It occurred to me that perhaps it would be useful if I actually showed what one of these procedures <laughs> looks like while we're chatting about it. But I'm, I've, I've gone to our website, and uh, this this is the interactive noise contours for um, the the ten left, the proposed ten left approach. The purple is the areas where the calculated noise. Sorry, I'm going to stop moving my mouse. Um, the the calculated areas where the noise might uh, increase slightly, and the green is the areas where the noise might decrease. This uh, procedure was not made for noise abatement purposes. It was made purely to, in these very rare occasions like like um, like, like was described, to, to give the pilots a precision approach path to the runways so that they land the first time, hopefully. Otherwise, there's a very high likelihood of, of having a go around because the existing approaches don't get the aircraft that close to the runways. Um, okay. So more landing noise for the North County, great. <laughs> Very rare so, occasions, I guess, when it happens. I wouldn't say more. I would just say that during the days when they're actually doing it, more. These are the options. Okay. Yeah. Thank so, you. So, you know, I, I I appreciate the question, and and you know, your original question was, I, I believe. You know what happens if there, if if you, you yourself or other uh, participants of the TWG. Um, uh, you know, would like to give more feedback to the FA as they consider the the changes to these procedures, like the RNF GPS uh, ten left and right. And because they're under development by the FA right now, there's um, yeah, I think Joe's comment to uh, provide feedback to the roundtable and then for the roundtable to submit that feedback to the regional administrator would probably be the most effective method. Um, right. But really, my question centered around that all along you said that if there's, it's found that the GLS procedures are not helpful for reducing noise or increased noise in a certain way, that they would be discontinued by the airport. This is not one of those that would have that, sorry, we don't like it, it's off the table because it would have been changed by the FAA already. That, so that statement's correct. Um, that statement is correct. That we, we cannot, control as an airport, the RNAV GPS or the RNAV RMP approaches. That's that's beyond us. Oh. And, and sorry, go ahead. There's a comment. I'm stepping on something. No, no, no. That was my only comment. I don't need to belittle it at all. I just wanted to get that statement out there as a definitive. Yeah, no, I I I I agree with the statement in this particular case because um the airport with with the the ownership of the NAVI, we have control over the GLS approaches. Um, if we find that they're not meeting our, our performance goals, but we do not have control over the RNF GPS or the RNF RMP uh, approach. So okay. uh, the, the other one that is that is following suit with this one is the GLS uniform and, and the RNP Yankee. The changes to that, however, I think are ultimately going to benefit the community because the tweaks to the waypoints that are being made actually move the aircraft just a little further away. From the shoreline, um, so we're we're actually kind of excited <laughs> about that about that change, um, and and that was that was that they came to that the FAA team working on that um, came to that after whew, a lot of effort to try to get the criteria to work. It's um, but unfortunately delays the publication until the twenty sixth of December, twenty twenty four. Other comments or questions? I, I do appreciate these questions. So Ms. Schneider's had her hand up for quite a while. Oh, sorry. Thank you. And a uh, couple of clarifying questions. Just talking about runway 10 arrivals. You talked about hopefully this will help um, miss landings. That's probably the wrong term. What do you call it when the plane has to circle back around? Oh, uh, either a go around or a missed approach, depending on where missed they- Missed approach, go around. I, I need to memorize those terms. When a 10 arrival in bad weather 
misses that, which way does it turn? Does it turn left over the bay or right over Millbrae? Uh, generally, it continues straight down the runways and, and then it gets uh, vectored to where they uh, either set the aircraft up to come back around. So it, it could be that they vectored them uh, left to go out. But generally, the aircraft that they go miss, they, they continue to fly straight over the airport. And then they, they make a left and go out over the bay or they make a right, uh, depending on how they're separating the airplanes. Okay. And the map that you showed that showed that the noise would increase to the north of the flight path, so into South San Francisco, into San Bruno Mountain, into Brisbane, is that at all uh, based on noise growing as it hits the mountains and goes up the mountains? Um, so for, for these particular approaches, um, elevation was considered, uh, at least for the, for the tens, yes. Okay, and then in terms of this being a reverse flow, as it was pointed out on a couple of round tables, reverse flow, we historically thought of it when the winds changed directions. But it, I was informed that we could have a reverse flow in, at SFO if Oakland for some reason has to change their operations during that time. And again, it changed significantly when we had massive fires that reversed, re reduced visibility all over Northern and Central California. So it is not all that that infrequent and is not specifically tied simply to a reverse airflow. Is that true? Um, so the, the, the choice by air traffic to land aircraft on the tens is is not taken lightly. Um, so, so reverse flow in the bay, you're absolutely right. It can happen if Oakland gets into a wind situation that's maybe different than San Francisco's. But generally in that situation, um, they would land aircraft into San Francisco on the 19s, not on the 10s. Um, especially, you know, in, in historically, it's just, it's a very, it's a very challenging arrival and approach stream uh, to try to manage. Um, so they've, they've tried, uh, they have tried, and they will continue to try to minimize um, aircraft flying these approaches to the tens, even when, you know, the weather's conspiring for Oakland to go one way and SFO to go the other. Um, okay. I, Bert, did you have any other comments you wanted to add on that? I didn't mean I did. I was going to say that typically what uh, Member Schneider's referring to is what we call a 2A, 2A condition, which is what we're in right now with the uh, closure of the ones. So if Oakland goes reverse flow and we're still in a west condition for ourselves, we will typically be going all west, landing and departing. And that's when that situation occurs. Okay. Now, is, I'm sorry, Bert. A 10 arrival typically is as the storm front's pushing through or pushing out we will experience what the controllers call around the world, meaning they're exercising landings and departings on almost all the runways. So if we go back, sorry to take us this way, but each of us who are a roundtable member, part of our responsibility is to explain to our own residents what's going on. Part of the problem and the reason we're looking at 10 right now, which might be incredibly rare, but a lot of reverse flow do happen on, on one and or takeoffs on 19, which impacts my community, Burlingame Hillsboro. And yet we have no data. When you look at the noise report, it doesn't talk about the numbers of these. And without data then, I used to, when I first got on the round table say, oh, okay, it's infrequent, it's for the good of the all. But in reality, given that Millbrae doesn't fit in the contours anymore, I am no longer in for the good of the all. Sorry, just not there. And I want to know every flight that flies over us because it's a missed landing, and that includes 28 arrivals or 19 arrivals on that. Or, yeah, 19 arrivals. So I'm just kind of bringing that up here. My one hope for GBAS is that it would reduce that, and it would reduce planes backing up during bad weather and then taking off during the middle of the night. I actually also think it means that there'll be more airplanes. I know you have told me multiple times it won't. I don't believe you. So data will show what will happen because SFO, since it's since it leased land from a Milbrae robber baron, has done nothing but grow and grow and grow on that. So I just would like that data and I'll be pushing it through on the report that we know how many overflights they are and where they go. And in terms of 10, I am getting more Pacificans calling me, saying they live up on the hill, kind of uh, off Skyline Boulevard, that they are hearing more things. 
what that's attributed to, I, that, that's a whole other thing. Um, but in terms of GBAS, 10 is the example. What I've asked for in 10 are the overflights and the missed landings. Is that for all runway, all of them? And we get that into the report. And, you know, if it only happens once in a blue moon, so be it. But if we've got a pilot that's missed a 28 arrival and then turns over Central Park, and I've got hundreds of kids playing there, and they dump fuel like a flight did going into LAX on a missed flight or a missed landing, then I need to know. Thank Member Schneider, you. thank you. All right, so we're gonna, any more questions on this? The update of the timeline, that was a lot longer than what we anticipated, Paul, I'm sure you have as well. But I would like to kind of move on to the, unless you have any more things to add to that, Paul, move on to the item at hand for us today, please. No problem. So I would like to cover uh, three of our six uh, Group 2A community flight procedure packages in some detail. And the one that I want to start on first is the GLS Down the Bay 1 or GLS DB1, just to just because I think that's a that's a good starting point for us to talk about what's in the packet, what we've what we're hoping um, you know, members and residents can can uh, glean information wise and, and how to look at it all kind of in, in that way. And then I'm going to go to the overwater one and overwater two, OW one and OW two. Um, so I've already gone ahead and downloaded each of the PDFs and I'm going to do my best. So I, I, I respect many of you in the room may have a printout of this. They are, um, I know it's not super environmentally conscious, but um, they are meant to be printed. Uh, in some cases, the pages are, are, these packages are put together in such a way that they're meant to go uh, left, right, uh, so to speak. So when we're looking at it as a PDF, I, I don't have quite the same capability. Um, so the first page of the community flight procedure package is um, basically like a, uh, it's like an index that tells you which pages of the PDF contain which information. And all of our community flight procedure packages have exactly the same uh, details, the same calculations, the same uh, graphical formats. So, um, the way that we do this is um, the, the first page is uh, the page numbers are down here in the lower left corner. So our first page here that is that's kind of our landing page or index. It's zero. Um, so when when we say page one, two, three, five, seven, nine, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, it, it is referencing um, not the PDF page number, but the printed one that you see on the lower left corner here. So just an important first detail. Um, and what we see here on page number one, printed page number one, is our three-dimensional depiction of the proposed approach procedure. Um, and what we typically do is we use a, a couple different colors uh, to show the phase of the approach um, you know, as it's being designed. The red one in this particular uh, approach procedure, that's the final approach. Um, ironically, that is the segment that the ground-based augmentation system is where, where it is actually performing, where it is delivering um, the, the precision and the autopilot guidance and the flight director guidance, um, you know, all the way in the future to touch down on the runway. So this very short segment for this particular procedure in red, that is the part that the ground-based augmentation system is actually uh, delivering. Every other part of the approach procedure is not using the ground-based augmentation system. Um, in this case, it's using um, the RNAV RNP uh, navigation uh, specification. So the white segments here are what we call the intermediate approach. And that's basically how we connect from uh, the beginning of the approach to the final approach segment. And then the blue is the initial approach. Um, so, so we're before the blue is where we're, we're in the high altitude structure, we're, we're on an arrival. Um, in this case, we're on the Bodega arrival. Um, and aircraft are making their way towards this waypoint called D-Bay. Um, and then once an aircraft is cleared to the D-Bay waypoint, they are now on the approach, which means they are on the path you see right here on printed page number one of the PDF. And this is, um, again, kind of from a scale perspective, the altitudes that they are going to fly and the track that they're going to take to get to the runway for the DB1. So um, we've got some white boxes. These are the names of the waypoints that are currently being used as we evaluate the procedure. Um, you're gonna see these names of waypoints appear kind of throughout the package uh, in other places. So when we look at the calculated noise, like the green and the purple, you're gonna see these waypoint names again. When we look at the profiles, where we're, we're trying to show what the speed of the aircraft is, what the calculated flap settings were, you're going to see those waypoint names again. And they're all, they're all intended to help um, people reading the packet get a sense of, okay, where was I? I'm, I'm halfway between uh, waypoint 152 and guts. Oh, the aircraft is in a turn. It's, it's just trying to help you kind of navigate between the pages that way. 
Um, the other thing that's important on this first page is on the two boxes on the bottom left and the right. On the bottom left, that is our team's kind of English description <laughs> of what we think this procedure is trying to do and why we are pursuing it. Um, so, you know, we, we have kind of just a short explanation, you know, talking about the procedure as, as if it was its own thing. And then the second part here is um, how we're, you know, what we're comparing it to. Um, so in this case, you know, the text says, you know, we, it's the GLS DB1 is the instrument approach to runway 28 right originating northwest of the airport, starting at the D-Bay waypoint. And then um, you know, we give some more text to say, this approach is similar to the GLS Whiskey runway 2A right from D-Bay. For those of you that, that don't have the secret decoder ring in front of you, GLS Whiskey was a, is a group one innovative approach procedure that is the down the bay approach. That's the first one that I think everybody was able to review. We, we're calling it GLS Whiskey because that is the FAA's official designator for that approach now that it's under development by the FAA for publication in March. Um, so it's it's very similar to it until it gets to waypoint 152. Uh, it then turns the aircraft, um, trying to keep it over the bay as best as possible to connect to the, the GLS Romeo and the r and Yankee track. Um, and, then, and then there's other information to say, if this is requested for development, this procedure will be used under most weather conditions. Um, for aircraft arriving from the north and northwest on the Bodega Star. And then on the Barnham box, it talks about which project goals we're hoping to achieve with this concept. So noise reduction, number one, um, ILS redundancy, because at the end of this approach, we will still get ILS category one minimums or something very close to it. Um, it does have an efficiency aspect to it. So if you are an aircraft coming from the north, this is one of the shortest paths that you can take to get to land on 28 right. So there's a, there is an efficiency aspect there. Um, it also has the opportunity to uh, reduce delays because again, it's, it's a relatively short track. Um, and because this is an instrument approach procedure and not vectors, this gives um, pilots the opportunity and air traffic controllers the opportunity to clear the aircraft and then go on with, with managing other flights. So, so working on uh, other aircraft separation and trying to find ways to, to um, you know, potentially get out of a delay situation. So that was page one. Page two of the publication. This is where we're providing some kind of technical information, you know, detail about the procedure that's being proposed. But it's a very important page for all of our green and purple sections that you're seeing. The left-hand side shows the existing approach that we are using to compare our proposed concept to to figure out how we're how we're calculating the noise differences. Um, so what that means is the approach on the left is, is the one that we're assuming kind of is, is the starting point. And then the approach on the right is the other one. We calculate the noise for both of them. And then that's how we come up with our green and our purple. Um, so in this case, because we know the GLS Whiskey is going to be published on, um, and in March of 2024, and we know that it's a, it's, it's a representation of, of, of a vectors maneuver that's done with some frequency today. We're treating that approach as our baseline. And then the concept that we're evaluating is on the right-hand side. Now, I apologize if, the, if you have a printout or if uh, I can zoom in quite a bit, actually, you can actually see quite a bit of detail. Um, for those of you that are pilots, this is what we refer to as a flight inspection graphic. Um, and it actually contains quite a bit of detail. Um, now, you'll see a note on here, this is not for navigational use. We are required to, to place that on these charts um, because this is not loaded into an airplane yet. It has not been quality assured by the FAA yet. Um, so do not, do not attempt to fly this. Um, but what you're seeing here are more precise definitions for the waypoints that are being used. And if you're really into um, interpreting charts, you'll see some very important clues that show up on these charts. One, there, there's two of them right here at the beginning of the approach. So if you look at the right-hand graphic under the word D-Bay, you'll see this, this number that says 11,000. And then right beneath it, you'll see this, this next uh, character, numerical character sequence that says 210K. The 11,000 and the fact that it's got a line above and below it means that aircraft, when they get to D-Bay, have to be at 11,000 feet. They can't be higher. They can't be lower. Now, I don't expect everybody to know this, but I'm just kind of telling you because you're going to see this a couple of different times on some of our approach procedures. Those lines um, tell the pilot when they get to that waypoint at that altitude whether they have uh, the freedom to be higher or the freedom to be lower. So a, a good example, um, today at um, uh, Eddy, as an example, it's at 6,000. There's no flexibility. The aircraft has to be there, so there's bars above and below. 
When we look at our overwater one and overwater two examples, you will see that there is no top bar, which means that the aircraft in some cases may be permitted to be a little bit higher if air traffic is able to get the aircraft there. So just a, an interesting uh, thing to note. 210K is a speed restriction. And in this sense, there it's very might be hard to make out, but there's a bar above it. And what this means is that for an aircraft to start this approach procedure, they must have already slowed down to 210 knots, which is, it's a nautical mile per hour. Um, uh, and, that, and that's an indicated airspeed. Um, so, you know, again, thinking about eddy and the, and the over energy situation, eddy and aircraft must be at 240 knots. On this approach procedure, they have to be at or slower than 210 knots before they begin this approach. So already we were, when we're, this information, this page is already telling us that this aircraft is not gonna be going super fast. It's gonna start off at a very high altitude. Again, we can use these pages to go back and forth. So I'm, I'm on page two, I'm just gonna go back to page one very quickly. So when I look at this picture here, which is the three-dimensional depiction, and I see this very tall blue bar over uh, kind of the more of downtown San Francisco, and then I go to page two and I zoom in a little bit, and there's other pages where you'll see this, but I'm just kind of using this one as a reference. You'll see that um, that aircraft's going to be at 11,000 feet when they cross over uh, downtown San Francisco. Um, some of the other things you can read from this are, are minimum altitudes. I'm not going to go into as much detail on that, um, but those are the minimum altitudes that the aircraft has to be at as they get to each successive waypoint, which means that um, by the time they get to GBAS 2, this number right here where it says 7,000, and then 095 and 109T, the 7,000 is the minimum altitude. They can't go below that as they're heading for GBAS 2. Those, those minimum altitudes published on the segment are another opportunity for this approach to keep the airplane a little bit higher, keep it closer to that optimized profile descent and, and potentially reduce noise um, as the aircraft comes through. So the speeds are important, the altitudes are important, these pages uh, you know, are, are, are very important to, to making sure we meet the goals. There's one other restriction that you'll see here, which is we have another one of those, one eight, we have another uh, numbers in a letter, 180K and a line above it. What this means is that um, the aircraft had to be at 210 knots or slower when they started this proposed approach. By the time that they get to this waypoint 152, they actually have to be going slower than 180 knots. Um, and that's in order to make this turn. If they're going any faster than that, there's a risk that the aircraft may have to bank so hard to make the turn that it that it decouples from the approach procedure. So we, from a procedure design perspective, we put that speed limit there um, to basically tell the pilots, by the time you get here, you need to be slow, and then you're going to have exactly the right amount of margin to safely make the turn. Um, well, so go ahead, question, yes. Question, yes. Yeah. So you're talking about certain elevation and not to go below a certain threshold. Would there be instances and this is what, how you're designing your approaches, right? Yes. There, would there be any instances where the pilot will not follow that? Or what happens if the pilot does not go below or above? And so forth? What, what safety measures that you will, for, from our perspective for noise, are there for this approach to be adhered to? Great question as always. So there's, there are two things that will, that will make sure that a, a pilot and the aircraft stay on this approach procedure. Um, so because these legs are designed as, with the RNAV RNP specification, um, the Boeing and the Airbus aircraft, which are the two primary types they're gonna fly it, they have this coded into their flight management system. And the pilots, when they activate this approach because they're cleared to fly it, the aircraft and the flight management computer is going to keep the aircraft automatically above all these altitudes. So the only situation that the pilot could go below any of these altitudes is if a human being took the took the controls and said, you know what, I want to go sightseeing. <laughs> I'm going to go, I'm going to go lower than this. So that, that would have been a human, uh, human in the cockpit decision or God forbid some kind of wild automation problem or maybe an aircraft problem. Um, there are other opportunities though, if for some reason um, the TRACON needed to create some separation. Let's say that they need to put some space between an aircraft that's on this approach and one coming into Oakland or something like that. Um, it is possible sometimes for the TRACON to choose to take an aircraft off of an approach and put it back on, but they have to do that before the intermediate fix, before the start of the intermediate approach segment. So if they were going to do that, they would have to do that in this initial approach segment um, but by the time they get to, in the proposed procedure, GUTS, which is the one I'm circling around right here on the right-hand side, 
Um, on the left-hand side, the, the waypoint is actually um, at Seepin. Um, the aircraft, they, they have to get everything back on altitude by Seepin. From that point on, if the aircraft is below altitude, that's a missed approach. The, the pilots are trained that if they've gone below those altitudes, they have to discontinue the approach. The only time they can go below prior to an intermediate fix is if the air traffic control told them to do it. Um, otherwise, air traffic is watching them and they'll see that the aircraft went below and they may tell them, hey, you're, you're too low, pull up. Like you, you're not on the approach anymore. Does that answer your question by chance? Absolutely, thank you. Okay. And another question, if I may. Sure. Um, these waypoints for these uh, GLS procedures, they are fly over or fly by? Super good question. Yes. Um, the current procedure that you see here um, are designed. So if, if you see like a little star shaped symbol um, and it's just the star, it doesn't have a circle around it. Those are fly by waypoints. The one exception is that the missed approach point here. See how, so if you're looking at the, the printout, there's a point, there's a point on the chart called VICU and it's a star and it has a circle around it. That's a fly over. Um, so all of the, the stars that don't have a circle around them, um, those are fly-by waypoints. So the aircraft, uh, and maybe this is where you were going with this question. So for instance, when they go from D-Bay to waypoint 152, somewhere around the GBAS-2 waypoint, the aircraft flight management computer is going to anticipate that a small turn is necessary, and it will literally fly by it. It won't go over GBAS-2. It'll just avoid it and, and get onto the next, uh, onto the next track. The um, this leg here, where they go from waypoint one five two to guts. So even though those don't have a circle over them, the way the aircraft is going to navigate that is it's it's going to fly it almost exactly like that radius. So it doesn't have to go over the waypoint to start or finish it. But the way the the way the navigation computer is going to going to treat that leg is it's going to because it's called an RF leg. It's going to keep it right on that arc or very close to it. Does that answer your question? It answers the question, but it brings up other ones. Why wouldn't they have a circle if that's the case? So if it, um, there are some criteria problems with having fly over fixes at the start or the end of an RF leg. So there's there are very, very specific situations where um, the FA is, is permitted to design a procedure, you know, where, you know, the beginning of the RF leg has a flyover or the end of it or both. Um, Generally speaking, you try to avoid that situation just to give the aircraft a little bit of flexibility to get into the turn and get out of it uh, smoothly. Um, so I'm, that may not be the best answer to your question, but um, in this particular case, we would expect if the aircraft um, needs to make this turn, if anything, it will fly just inside of it. Um, so it would, it would not go to the outside of the leg, it would go to the inside of it ever so slightly and then catch up to the rest of the RF and then come out again just on the inside of it. So the, so the risk for this procedure is that the aircraft might be more over the water rather than less over the water. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions before I move on? So on the bottom of this approach, or uh, of the bottom of page two of the CFPP, we've got information on the bottom left that talks about our team's understanding of what percentage of aircraft are capable of using the approach. Um, it doesn't mean that they're going to use it. That is going to be more up to the weather and air traffic and how things are, are going on the day of operation. Um, this is our projection of how many aircraft are coming into San Francisco at the time that this concept would come into existence that could, if they were given this approach, fly it. The reason, so you'll, you'll notice regional business jets for us is very, very low. Right now, there are very limited plans for regional jet aircraft or business jet aircraft to um, become GLS capable. We hope that changes in the future, um, but for now and for the next couple of years, we don't see that number coming up. That's why it's a very low number. For the narrow bodies and the wide bodies, that reflects our current understanding of the um, of the aircraft types that are, are coming in from the north in this particular situation. So just, just to be very blunt, um, right now, American Airlines and Alaska Airlines do not have the op spec to fly a GLS approach. And obviously those two uh, operators fly a fair amount. From, uh, from Northern destinations, as does Delta. Um, but we do know that United um, United and Delta, some of Delta's fleet types and a larger majority of United's fleet types constitute the 30% numbers that we see there. Um, and then we know that Southwest is actually just in the process of activating its offspec for GLS. So, so, so these numbers may go up a bit, but that's what we're estimating there on the left. Um, so it may go higher than 30%, um, but we're starting with that estimate for now. The right-hand side, 
is our team's estimation of when this procedure would be used relative to weather conditions. So um, you'll see here, we, we have four levels, VFR, MVFR. So VFR is visual flight rules. It means like there's not a cloud in the sky, there's no rain, you know, everything's, everything's beautiful. MVFR is mostly VFR, which means, yeah, there, there's a little bit of a cloud kind of here and there. Um, IFR is when we are now down um, and, the, and certain category one minimums are starting to come into effect. So IFR is, you know, like the, the clouds are relatively low or uh, we, have, we have more limited visibility. Um, across the bay, and then low IFR is uh, yeah we're into we're we're into like uh, ILS category two category three category you know where you there is like the clouds are down on <laughs> almost on the runways themselves and we're not seeing very far so um, GBAS can actually work in all four conditions um, but these procedures that we're talking about are not all intended to be used under all conditions and what you'll notice here is that. This particular proposal to use the down the bay one is intended to be used even up to IFR conditions, like standard kind of category one. But when we get to really low IFR, this is not the this this particular procedure is not one that is intended to be used by air traffic. Um, and the reason for that, and I'm going to go back to this picture, is um, one of the, the the stakeholders that are interested in this particular concept from the flight procedures subcommittee are very interested in this because they believe that um, there may be more opportunities to use this curved, this procedure because it has this curved leg right here with other aircraft that are already coming into 28 left. Um, and so, so there, there is a hope that um, if this procedure is of interest to the community um, and it were to go forward and be published, that um, this one would be used while other aircraft are coming into 28 left. That generally requires good weather to be happening. So if we're getting into kind of cruddy weather, the, th those separation rules change and we can't, you couldn't use this one at the same time as, as one of those other approach procedures, or you can only use it, you know, more sparingly. So we're only ex expecting this, you know, through IFR. Um, I'll pause there before we go to the next page. Questions? Hearing none. Let's go to the first of, oh, go ahead. Nobody on to Okay, go ahead. Well, thank you. Sure. So now we're, we get into the first of the calculated noise pages. Um, and there's a couple things that I'm going to want to point out both on this page and the next one. Um, so as we've talked about in the past, we have four different aircraft types that we are presenting here. Um, so this one is narrow body uh, one. And again, you know, we have restrictions. We're trying to use the most accurate performance model that we can and the most accurate noise model that we have available to us to, to come up with these noise calculations. Um, and the problem is we have a we have a restriction that says that when we compare, when we use those that platform and that technology to put noise out there that directly compares two aircraft side by side, which is kind of what we're doing, we're not allowed to say what the aircraft was um, because that's that's just a condition. It's a license agreement that we have to sign with with Euro control to get this kind of higher power data. Um, so we, we have narrow body one, uh, which is represented a representation of kind of the current generation of narrow body aircraft that are capable of flying GLS approaches. We have narrow body two, which is um, kind of the, the more modern and emerging narrow body aircraft that have like the newest engines with all the newest kind of noise reduction capabilities and the highest thrust capabilities. Um, so, so those are also GLS capable as well. So just, just to throw some example airplanes, um, narrow body one would be like your standard 737s, your standard A320s, um, things like 757s, et cetera, right? That is, that's like a narrow body one kind of aircraft. A narrow body two aircraft, I'm just going to jump to it so you can look at the page. This is like a um, 737, you know, like a MAX 8, like the MAX aircrafts or the NEOs, the A320 NEO family. Those are the kinds of aircraft that would fall in a narrow body two. Wide body one, um, in this particular case, is really representative of like a two engine wide body aircraft. So things like your 777s or your A350s or A330s or things like that, frequent visitors to SFO. And wide body two is more like your four engined uh, visitors. Um, so A380s, 747 uh, family in that nature. Not as many aircraft in this particular family, but um, enough that we can use these four terms and, and stay within our, our um, requirements not to make direct comparisons. So again, so we've got four different sets of data here. 
And what we've got is the black line that you see on just, just looking at page three, that is the uh, flight track. So to, to remember O'Connell's uh, point about fly by versus fly over waypoints, um, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. One of the first things you'll notice is that um, when the aircraft, we, we've started the aircraft back here at, at Bodega, um, just to show where the plane would come from, you know, as it comes from the arrival onto the approach. And because the start of the approach is not fly over, you'll notice that that black line, which is where we think the track of the aircraft is gonna go, does not fly over D-Bay. It goes just to the north of it, right? It curves just past it. Again, when it gets to GBAS-2, it curves just inside of it. Um, when it gets to the RF leg, it's gonna be pretty close to on track. So it cuts around. I'm sorry, was there a question or a comment? I'll keep going. Um, yeah. and, and then for this particular procedure, even though it's a bunch of fly-by waypoints, because they're RF legs, we are expecting, and, and the software that we, we use to do this also expects the aircraft is going to stay on that black line fairly closely. All of our noise calculations for the proposed procedure are based on the black line that you see. The existing procedure that we're comparing to, we don't show that track here, um, but that's what we're using to make the, the comparison calculations against. So. Um, I'm going to back out in the zoom just to this level right here. Um, so what we're showing here are the noise contour that you see with the dashed line. That is the noise contour that was calculated for the, um, I'm trying to make sure I've got this right, for, the, in this case, this is for the, the proposed concept. So the green represents how those contours are shifting from the existing approach, which in this case was the down the bay, to the new proposed concept. So if it's green, it means it's shifted, it's shrunk, or it's moved away from a populated area. And if it's purple, it means it's expanded. It's moved somewhere that it, it didn't used to exist before. So we're, if, if it's expanding, that means that um, there's a potential that the noise, there's increased noise in these purple areas. And if it's green, it means there's a potential for decreased noise. One of the key things to keep in mind when you're looking at this way of looking at aircraft noise is that we are making a division for these, these little polygons every five dB SEL. Um, so it's a single event, it's not, it's not combined. Um, and it's, it's five decibels, which should be, five decibels should be perceptible to the human ear. Usually three decibels is like the cutoff. So five, you would, you would most likely hear that change. If you start to see one contour overlap with another one, like in a green area, like I'm showing right here, that means that if you happen to live in this area where there's overlapping green contours, it's possible based on this calculation that for a narrow body aircraft that's flying this approach, the noise reduction for you would be more than five decibels. Like it, that, that's a pretty good outcome. Like the best procedures when you look at noise this way would be ones where the noise contours actually start to overlap with benefit. That, that is most likely going to be uh, noticeable, but it's important, and I, I've, I've got to really stress this when you're looking at the CFPPs, to remember what we're comparing. So in this case, we are comparing the GLS Whiskey, which is the down the bay approach, to the DB1. That's the proposed concept. That's what you're seeing here with these, these changes. So we're not, we're not trying to, you know, like the, the, the down the bay, one, the down the bay approach did have some advantages. It had some slightly higher altitudes. So the fact that this approach still finds ways to improve and potentially reduce noise in the residential areas means that um, this, this could be a very beneficial procedure from a noise perspective, which is one of our goals. So that's, that's one thing that I want to point out. Um, the, the bottom half of these graphics is a simplified way of looking at the people who live in the calculated SEL contours. Again, these are not CNEL contours. That's a different concept, a different kind of math. This is one aircraft making the flight, which we think is the most comparable way for how residents experience you know, that flight or that one, that one airplane. Um, so in this case, we take these contour intervals. So the 50 contour is, is this one here. It's, it's this huge contour that goes all the way out to Bodega and wraps all the way around. We look at the people that live inside of this huge, you know, 50 dBA contour. And we say, did if that contour shrunk, how many fewer people are now in that contour? If the contour grew, how many people are, are in that contour now? And in this particular case, um, we found that the, um, the populations that were exposed to 50, 55, et cetera, et cetera, 
it all decreased um, basically because the noise was further constrained over the bear itself. On the other point right here where you see sample points, um, this is where this little box right here, this is where we are trying to provide some other comparison information about what's happening at specific points. In some cases, we're using a noise monitor, like an established noise monitor. In other cases, we're using like a waypoint. So in this case, we were looking at D-Bay, which is here, um, and Axmul, um, which is right about here where this arrow is pointing to. Um, so an interesting side effect of this particular approach, this, this just shows the altitude differences here. I'm going to zoom in, it's probably hard to see. This shows the altitude differences here. So at D-Bay, the existing procedure and the one that's being proposed, exactly the same altitude, and the, the noise, it's calculated the same way. By the time the aircraft gets to Axmul, however, even though this aircraft um, is taking a slightly tighter procedure, we actually expect that the, the one that we're proposing would be about 100 feet lower um, if you were to look kind of down the bridge, basically, and go between the, this point here, which we call uh, Don 9, we're just trying to give it a name, versus Axmol, the aircraft would be 100 feet lower. But in spite of the aircraft being lower, because it's further over the water, if we were just looking at this spot right here, the calculated noise is significantly lower. Um, so it's just a different way of kind of looking at the noise uh, in the sense. Before I move on to the next graph, the next page that supports this, questions? Let me stop. None here. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I don't remember questions on Zoom either. Oh, I'm sorry. Was there a question? No, no question. No. Perfect. The next page tells us a lot about why that noise calculation looks the way it does. Um, so what we provide here are four different profile graphs. Um, all of these are taken from our calculation. And uh, in this case, the, the orange path and all the orange uh, profile views that you see, that was the existing calculation. And the blue lines that you see, that's the, the one that's being proposed. So you can kind of see the comparison. It gets a little bit complicated in these group 2A procedures because in some cases, the procedure that we're trying to use as the baseline and the proposed one have very different track miles and they have very different altitudes. And so things start to get very different when you look at it this way. But from the spirit of transparency, why we wanna share this information so that people have all the information that we have uh, to, to help make determinations. So the top one is the altitudes. And as you can see here, the altitudes between the proposed and the existing are, are almost completely identical. There are some very small track mile changes, but it's, it's fairly straightforward. Um, the flap setting information here, you can see when, what, how we think the, the schedule of the flap settings would basically transpire. Um, and then we show net thrust. Net thrust is very important because that's the value that's being used for the noise calculations. Um, and so if you see one procedure as you're moving kind of close, so on the right-hand side, we're, we're at the beginning of the approach. On the left-hand side, we're at the end of the approach, kind of getting to the runways. Um, so if you see the net, the net thrust starting to be higher, you know, for one profile or another, that's a likely source of why the noise might be increasing. Um, the other, the last one we see here is for the ground speed. So um, each of these charts that you see here corresponds to the noise calculation that was made here. They, they, they go hand in hand. So we have that data for the four different air, aircraft types. Again, just looking at DB1. So this is narrow body two and it's supporting information. You can see that there's some, some potential calculated thrust differences that are happening for this aircraft. And that translates to you know, more significant potential noise reduction. When we look at wide body one, again, we're seeing um, you know, primarily you know, the potential for, for noise reduction. There are some very, very thin purple bands that you see here on East Bay. Um, these bands are, are, are uh, related to the fact that this waypoint right here had to shift a little bit further to the east than the waypoint we're using for the, for the upcoming down the bay approach. So when you, even though the aircraft are going to be very high and they're going to have slowed down and they're going to have better kind of energy management opportunities, these purple bands are, are just a relationship to the fact that this waypoint had to go to the east a little bit. Um, I, I know Christian Valdez couldn't be with us today, but one of the things he wanted to point out is that when you see very, very small bands, be they purple or green, um, they're very likely not going to be perceptible to the human ear. Um, so if, you know, the distance between this line and this line is five, if three is where you start to hear it, um, you can imagine you'd, you'd basically have to be, you know, over halfway um, of, of a contour to be able to really hear that in that area. So that's why body one question. So, so one question on that, in this flight track, would it 
give you an indication of where speed brakes might need to be applied? That's a great question. Um, here's where my team looks to see if we think speed brakes might, might be applied. So we actually look at these charts with considerable detail. And what we're looking for are situations where either the speeds, this, this bottom chart down here are starting to get um, a little bit mismatched where the existing speed or the proposed speed are starting to get a little bit high. We're also looking at this box right here, which is the net thrust. That net thrust box is telling us what did the, what did the performance model think had to happen for that aircraft to continue to slow down to make the approach. One of the warning signs is, and we this, this almost got there, but it didn't. If you ever see a graph like this, where these orange values or these blue lines go below the axis, that is an indication that the aircraft, the, the, the performance model could not slow itself down just by cutting off the thrust, which means that the only tool left to slow that aircraft down was a speed brake or some kind of aerodynamic deceleration. So the program just magically makes it happen. It says, well, I, I don't have any more net thrust left, so I'm gonna make like a negative net thrust. Not actually gonna happen in the real world. What negative net thrust actually means is speed brakes were deployed. So we look very closely at these net thrust tables here to see if we're running into that situation. And then that gives us the indication that a speed brake would need to be applied. Um, in this case, you know, we're very close, but for this particular aircraft, we don't believe it would happen. They're actually just starting to, um, this is where they're starting to come around to the final, almost the final approach. So we're, they're, they're going to be getting into the landing configuration, which you can see right here, they're already at a very high flap setting. So we wouldn't expect speed brakes. We just expect landing flaps to be deployed. Does that answer your question? Okay. Because landing flaps can also be quite loud. And so I'm not sure how that would um, you know, so when we see these uh, vertical lines with the straight drop down on this chart in the thrust box, is that showing flaps or is that showing, would that be speed brakes? What's causing that other than it's, just letting off the gas? It's a great question. Uh, yeah. What's it's great... causing that to happen? Great question. Yeah. So, so in this particular area right here, the orange is the existing. This is the one that is currently uh, under development. In this area, the wide body one aircraft, in some cases may find that they need to deploy a landing flap a little bit earlier than, than what we are calculating. That is, that is the risk. So when they get close to, and we can look at this, like the guts are the seep and waypoint. Um, when they are in, when they're out here, it's, sorry, I'm missing, yeah, I'm still on wide body one. When they're out here, there's a possibility that as the procedure is currently designed, um, the existing procedure, not the one that we're currently evaluating, there's a possibility that they might need a slightly higher flap setting at that point, um, basically to continue approach. That's what this chart is telling us right here. Okay, because you know, I and I'm only using my personal limited flight knowledge of when I'm on a plane and I we're getting ready to land, and you can tell when they're doing things when they're letting off the gas when they're giving it gas, when they're putting flaps and when they're doing speed brakes. Um, and I don't know how that is you know, received on the ground because I'm in the flight, but that's the only time I... Well, I usually say, um, pardon me for interrupting, but I usually say if you can hear it on board, odds are you're going to hear it on the ground as well. True, but I most of the time I'm just hoping they're going to land and not <laughs> worry about the rest of it. <laughs> Um, but anyway, I, that, I just wanted to ask that question. I have one quick question. Sure. Um, in looking at the, uh, well, any of these, the narrow body two, when we're looking at, that shows um, a little bit of purple in it. This is comparing it to the uh, down the bay. What's the down the bay GLS called? The one that's going to be in. in, in Not yet. In. It's, it's, a, it's official FAA designator is the GLS whiskey. GLS whiskey, okay. So if we were to look at the, if we could magically com combine the GLA whiskey, GLS whiskey with this one and compare it to the existing flight tracks. Now I know there's no current published procedure for the, for the down the bay. There, there was briefly right after next gen, but that disappeared fairly quickly. But we do have, you know, a lot of historical vectoring down the bay, right? Yes. And so that's what people are used to getting overhead then is this historical vectoring. 
Um, so is there a way that we can comp compare that historical vectoring with a comb com combined um, GLS whiskey combined with this down the bay? Short answer. Yes. So they'll get it in piecemeal. They get a little bit of change in whenever that is, January, March, whatever. And then they'll get another one, another bit of change later on. But if we could look in advance and combine those two and say, overall, what are we getting for our people? Can we do that? Very possibly. Um, I, I know Bert's got a lot of the historical uh, vector tracks um, that we could try to combine. Are, are you are you asking if we could use uh, the vector tracks as the basis for a noise comparison? Is that what you're thinking? Yes. Uh, if you want to give it a new name, a community basis or, a, or a, an actual historical per basis, perceived, a perceived basis by the community today before any of this is, is implemented, because we know we're looking at two things that are coming down the pipe for this. And we don't really know what we're what we're getting at the end of that two process. Yeah. This combines it, this compares it to part one, and then part one compared it to, well, never compared it to historical, I don't think. That's correct. Part one, um, there was no, we 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 didn't attempt to make a, a single event comparison to vectors. Um the vector tracks are all over the place <laughs> from what we've seen as a team. Um, lots of, lots of really creative work, um, you know, a high skill, uh, air traffic, uh, yeah. and pilot maneuvering to, to get the aircraft to come around. But yes, some of, some of those, uh, vectors take the aircraft over more populated areas on the East Bay. Some of them are very, very tight, uh, coming in, you know, and I think the short answer is, can we, is there something we can potentially look at? Yes. I need to take it back with Bert offline and just figure out what the best way to do that is. Um, but maybe uh, maybe we'll have something by our, our next TWG to present on that particular front. Because my thinking now is if you look at this and you see those purple lines, albeit they're very thin and narrow ones and, and probably not discernible to the people, um, that probably is not an increase to the actual perception on the ground today that they're getting. This is this is compared to an intermediary, intermediate step that still doesn't exist today that that's you're correct you're correct we are comparing yeah you're right it, it, yeah it's um it it these these noise increases would be very very difficult to perceive uh, on this side relative to a procedure that you're correct has not yet come into come into existence yep. so I, it's just hard for me to to see how i could say oh green is good purple is bad when purple might not be bad at all because because we don't know what the vectoring is taking. What, doing what, to we don't really know what they're flying now today. Yeah. Because they don't always fly the procedure. They there get a vector. No most, I mean, really, yeah, it's vectored all the time. So we sort of need a sort of like a an actual impact baseline um, for what is it, what is going on overhead their houses right this moment. Does that make sense? Uh, it does, and I, I see Joe put his hand up, so I might uh, I might let let Joe take a jump in. <laughs> yeah, the difficult part here is is we really I guess we really have to look at the tracks because you could be be potentially comparing apples to oranges, um, because you're here you're going to have a procedure an aircraft on a procedure right they're going to fly that procedure minus the margin of error whatever that is for this procedure right. Where when you're talking vectoring aircraft, that's much different, right? They're gonna they could potentially be lower altitudes, they could be way off. Um, so you could essentially be comparing apples to oranges. I'm not saying that's the case here, but depending on how those tracks are, you may be comparing apples to oranges here. Um if if you were to exhaust that means of trying to do that. Um, I, I get what you guys are saying. Um, and I'm trying to think in my mind how to best do that as well. Um, but I think it may be very difficult for Paul and his team to to do something like that, just based on the sole fact that those aircraft are being vectored and who knows where they're going to be. And then how far out do you go? Do you include in that noise contour that you're going to compare to what today is, right? So there's all different factors in there that, that are going to be very difficult to to manage there. Sorry, Paul, I didn't want to. Nope. Don't yeah, so, we, so we don't know. Looking at this chart, 
you know, if we're doing the people in the East Bay any favors, or maybe we are doing them favors by giving them a, a controlled approach that is going to be lower than what they're getting now from vectors. We, we don't have anybody know that. Well, what we can do is take the flight drives to go down the bay and drop into what we use for modeling, make a spline out of it, figure out where the heaviest percentages are and the allocations left and right of center and just do that. Yeah. I think it'd be a guesstimate, but you know, all it's of this very educated. Yeah, it's well, a enough. guesstimate. Yep, I, I think I think we can take that action away and see see what our team can come up with. Um, and so I'll 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 take that I'll take that one for our team. Thank you. Yep. I so just I, I, I'm trying to be respectful of the time, and I, I really appreciate that uh, I'm probably going into a lot of detail. There's one last thing that I do want to cover relative to the CFPP, and then I'm going to jump over to the Overwater 1 and Overwater 2 to go through those, not in quite as much detail, but just to chat about the Overwater 1 and Overwater 2. Um, so so the the I'm on the PDF, for the printed page number 11, again, looking at the bottom 11 and 12. They're very, very similar looking, but all of our community flight procedure packages have these. Um, and this is this is like our summary section. Um, and this was created, you know, so we've got all this information in the in the preceding, you know, 10 pages. And then we wanted to draw everybody's attention to this, these kind of more simplified views to look at at least some what we think are key data points to help, you know, compare again that that baseline procedure to the one that's being proposed. So the, the existing procedure here, which is the GLS whiskey. So we've got information about, I'm going to zoom in a lot. Um, so this is narrow body one and narrow body two for are on page 11 and then wide body one, wide body two are on page 12. And it's meant to be just kind of a, a left right comparison. So population within the 60 dBL SEL contour, again, single um, event sound exposure level. Um, so we can see the population. So for the the proposed with the GLS whiskey, it's you know 76,000 with the DB1, it goes down to 57,000. And then we show that difference here. So that's a decrease of, of 19,000 people in the 60 DB SEL. Do the same thing for 75. We have our altitude comparisons for kind of two key you know, locations. These locations change by each CFPP. We try to we try to pick points that we believe are, are important to the folks who are doing the review. Um, we have our uh, SEL calculations. And then uh, so we can see how those potentially change. And then we have uh, the speeds uh, because some of our procedures, we are looking you know, at a procedure that might have an energy related problem. So we want to give that. Um, and then we have a breakdown of our number of arrivals. Now, this is a very, we, we hope that we could break down the number of arrivals to this kind of granularity between you know, 7 a.m. local and 7 p.m. local, and then you know, starting to get into sunset and then getting into the nighttime hours. At this time, many of our procedures, it's far too difficult to predict, um, you know, this kind of dispersion. Um, there are some where we think we might be getting some better estimates and we can revise this in, in the near future, especially for overwater one and overwater two. Um, but for right now, uh, we have these kind of broken out in this way. And then we have, um, does the IA, does the innovative approach meet current regulations? For the DB1, and we've talked about this a little bit, we do have this challenge right now with TCAS modeling. Um, and again, that's because there is a hope that this, this proposed procedure can be used at the same time that other aircraft are landing 2-8 left. But for that to work means that there's a TCAS challenge that has to be resolved that has not been fully resolved just yet. So even if we get through this year and the subcommittee and the roundtable uh, believe that this is a good procedure to take forward, we may still have to resolve this TCAS issue. So I that we I know it's a very small point in a very long packet, but it's an important one that we need to point what out. What is TCAS? Traffic Collision Avoidance System. Thank and it's a super valid question. And and TCAS is is it's an important system on aircraft that helps um, two or more airplanes that may be flying in close proximity to each other to anticipate where each aircraft thinks the other one is going to be. And if they think that they're gonna to get too close to each other or potentially collide with each other, that computer, that system tells the pilot of both aircraft what to do to try to resolve that situation. In some cases, it saved lives. It's, it, it, it has actually worked the way you hope and it overcomes otherwise human errors. In other situations like San Francisco, the box gets a little bit aggressive. And even though, 
Two pilot, two sets of flight crews and air traffic know exactly where those planes are going. Even though they look just like they're heading towards each other, um, the box starts to go off, the TCAS starts to go off and it tells the pilots to do something that would not result in a landing, that would result in a go around. And that's one of these challenges when we have runways that are very close together is that system gets very aggressive um, and we have to be very careful and try to design our procedures to minimize the likelihood that those TCAS warnings go off when it's where we want the planes to be. It's a big challenge. It's a now challenge. It took out one of the suggested uh, procedures already because it was just going to be a TCAS one. This one we, is not quite as bad, but we need to evaluate it in more detail before this procedure could be published. Other questions? Okay, hearing none, I wanna spend just a second to talk about the overwater one. So I'm not gonna go into the same level of detail with the package that we did, but we have two overwater procedures and I, re I recognize we only have a few minutes left. Chair Hindi, is it possible to go just a few minutes over today? Absolutely, I think uh, we need to, if you're willing, we appreciate it. I, I'm more than willing, I'm, I'm, I'm here to answer as many questions as I can. So thank you for, for the extra few minutes. Um, for the overwater one and overwater two, um, again, we have this three-dimensional view. Now, for this procedure, you'll notice that in addition to the blue and the white and the red, we have these, these, these green boxes. And the green boxes here are intended to help our, our readers of the Community Flight Procedure Package to understand that there is, a, there is a definite benefit or something positive that's potentially happening just in the way the procedure is designed. Set aside noise calculations, set aside ground tracks, um, and so in this case, what we're saying is that we're comparing this, this proposed overwater one procedure. We have a higher altitude at Eddy than what we were comparing it to. So today, there's a mandatory altitude at Eddy at 6,000 feet. For these overwater procedures that we're examining as, as potential procedures in the future, that altitude goes up by 1,000 feet and the required speed comes down by 30 knots. So not only are we getting the planes a bit higher, we're also reducing the speed at the start of the approach right there from the asset for this particular example. So um, there are some potential benefits that could come along with that. There are also restrictions that come along with this particular procedure because it could not likely be used during high traffic periods. So this would be like a late night, nighttime thing. And I know we've talked about that before, but I just wanna, I wanna point that out. So with, with some great benefits come some restrictions. Um, those altitude gains actually remain. So if you're heading down towards side by, we're 300 feet higher than the procedure we're comparing to. Um, and that 300 foot gain lasts all the way out until the aircraft gets out over the water for this particular example. So that's what the green boxes are, are attempting to show. Um, again, you know, our, just to point out our project goals here, um, noise reduction, yes. ILS redundancy, yes. Efficiency, no. This is not a more efficient path into the airport. We would also not anticipate that this approach does anything to reduce delays. This is a noise abatement procedure through and through. Um, so again, another key here for us, and I'm looking at today's community flight procedure package. We chose as a project team, the, the GLS uniform as the baseline for comparison. And the reason why I wanted to lead off today's TWG talking about the fate of the GLS uniform being delayed to December of 24 is that we think we need to update this community flight procedure package to choose a different approach procedure to compare it to because it's gonna be a long time before anybody has a chance to hear or experience that GLS uniform. Um, and one of the things we would like to do is to take our Overwater 1 and our Overwater 2 proposals and compare them to the existing ILS. This was a recommendation from the TWG participants, and I think it's one that we'd like to take seriously. Um, so, so I'm just going to show this page from the PDF. This is what you have in your hands right now. For each of our four aircraft, we are showing purple and green relative to an upcoming procedure, the GLS uniform, which already had some noise benefits. We've gone ahead and we've calculated the same graphics and I put them in this handout for all of the airplanes. And that's what I'd like to do right now because we are going to, we are planning to change our CFPPs this month for the over one and over water two to reflect this noise calculation here. Um, so just, just going through it very quickly, if we compare the proposed over water one to the existing ILS or, or existing GLS overlay, they're identical, um, this is the kind of green and purple that we would see. So I'm going to go to go to a big screen here. This is narrow body one. This is narrow body two. I'm, I apologize that the map jumped around a little bit. I'm so sorry. When they get in the CFPP, it's a bit cleaner. 
Um, so now in narrow body one, you can see that there's there's virtually no purple. Um, this these purple areas, by the way, um, this is this is something we struggle mightily with um, with with the noise calculation platform that we have to use. And the challenge comes when we are calculating one path that has a specific set of track miles versus a different path that has a wildly different set of track miles. And we have to try to get them so that they match back up and the calculation starts at the same point in the beginning. So these purple lines that you see here, in particular for the overwater one and overwater two, if you see them here, that has more to do with a calculation kind of accuracy rather than a real world noise increase. So I just, I wanna point that out. Um, that we are not expecting any noise increases here. That's, that's just a challenge we run into with the platform we have. Um, so we do see huge amounts of potential calculated noise increase, you know, for narrow body one um, over, you know, round table cities and definitely coming backwards into uh, Palo Alto. Um, and then as we look at the narrow body two aircraft, again, very similar. There's a very tiny increase in purple here. This is not a calculation error. This is intentional. Um, and that has to do with the fact that this waypoint right here over water 204 is slightly west of the existing ILS track. And that's what's happening here. That's what these tiny little purple bands are. They would be very difficult to perceive, but that's what's happening. Um, so we wanna be, we wanna point that out. When we go to wide body one, again, similar, we do see that little shade of purple right in here where my cursor is moving, but overwhelming green areas for, for most of over, over water one. Um, and then wide body two, again, um, we do see more of the purple in this case. And again, this purple is related to the fact that this waypoint right here over water 204 is just slightly west of, of the existing track. Um, if we look at over water two, which is the more aggressive kind of over water path, and we compare it to the ILS, again, this is what we're seeing here on the screen. And these are going to go into the CFPPs unless there's a, a, a strong reason why we shouldn't do this. Um, very open to comment, obviously. Um, again, we see we see um, you know even more significant potential noise decreases with the overwater two design. Um, but something I want to point out is that you do see that this purple area here to the east starts to pick up just a little bit. Um, so, and I apologize, it's a bit hard to see, but you do see that the noise increase starts to occur here in um, in, in some of the some of the areas that are kind of just before the shoreline. So, while the path of the aircraft is not necessarily changing from an area where airplanes fly today. Um, the noise that could come along with it for some of the, the folks who live in this area could be slightly louder. Um, so I, I want to point that out, that that is a possibility with the overwater tube. Even though it's higher altitudes, even though it's better energy management, there is a possibility that, you know, when we look at not so much for a narrow body one, but for a narrow body two, there's a slight possibility. For wide body one, it's a, it's a very small possibility, but wide body two, again, there's, a, there's that possibility again. Um, so, so excuse me. The what you're showing us on the screen right now is not in our packet. This is what we have is a, what is this actually comparing it to? Right here. Yes, it's it's a fair it's a great question. And so if I go to over if I go to overwater one, what's in your packet right this second? You have graphics that look like this with significant purple areas on one side versus the other. This one compares the proposed over one or water one procedure to the GLS uniform or the, or the RNP Yankee that's out there today. Um, because that GLS, right, but, go ahead. But you, the first ones you were comparing it to the ILS procedure, which we don't have those graphics. That's correct. My, the okay. project team would like to change the CFPPs this month to reflect this as the baseline for comparison, if you all believe that and, that is. And the baseline we're currently using is what baseline? The one that's published right now is the GLS uniform procedure, which has not published and will not publish until December of 24 now. So do I understand, Paul, that you're suggesting that what you have up on the screen now will replace what we're looking at in our packets now by changing the comparison to an ILS rather than the uh, GLS? Correct. Yes, yeah. this, this change, so the delay, okay. the, de the decision to delay the GLS uniform to December happened Friday. <laughs> Um, uh, otherwise, we would have come to you with a, with a slightly different uh, set of expectations on what to present, but we, we're trying to adapt to, to the change. Um, and so we believe that because that GLS uniform is so far off now from publication, 
it's probably better for us as a team to use the ILS as the basis for comparison. Well, and it also, this would not meet the, the goals of the community based on the GLS because it, it um, doesn't reduce noise reduction. And so it would be something that would get bleeped. <laughs> well, that's a good point as well. Um, and, and this is a challenge of single, looking at a single flight to compare noise um, is that it, it becomes very sensitive to which procedures we're comparing against. So for, oh, go ahead. I feel like I'm... Well, you'd want to compare it to something that's gonna make it look favorable. Um, and it certainly doesn't look favorable using the GLS procedure. Um, and it does, in theory, look favorable using the ILS. Um, but is that what our people are really going to hear? Paul, for clarification, the ILS is what everybody's getting overhead right now, correct? Yeah. That's correct. That's correct. But that might be replaced with the GLS. Right, but this is the, the one he's showing us now is the great is comparing it to reality. So right, and and yeah, this yeah. And this, one, yeah, this, this one here on the screen being implemented. Yeah, this one here on the screen, yeah, it is is the closest comparison to what a resident living in South Bay cities right now would experience. Right, uh, it just like if you're out there tonight and you hear an aircraft come in the vector versus not on the map before yeah okay so this is a this is a good great valid comparison for community purposes yes okay yeah yeah so the, but i but i respect and i just as one member of a team respects that um this may be a situation and I'll, I'll i'll take a look at the overwater too that maybe looking at it two different ways is the best way to get to the highest value feedback um, because comparing it to the ILS would would potentially potentially lead someone like myself to think that both the overwater one and overwater two they, they both look like they could achieve our project goals when we compare it to the ILS so if we then you know wanted to dive deeper and compare it to what you have in the packages then we get a, a slightly more refined look at how would it stack up against you know procedures where we've already tried to make some other enhancements and in this case if just looking at the information that we've provided, I'm just going to look at the overwater two as an example. The overwater two example looks a little better at achieving its goal than the overwater one does. At least that's what that's kind of what we're that's what I'm seeing by with all the information that I've I've got calculated. And the, so. and the overwater two, you're not going to be changing whether it's for, and this is still based. Overwater two is based on which. Over, so. Great question. The packages that you have uh, printed out in front of you, they're both based off of the GLS uniform. They're both based mm -hmm. off of that procedure that's now not going to get published until December of 24. We are proposing to change our CFPPs, um, you know, to, to basically reflect the ILS for both of them to, so that you can compare okay. Overwater 1 and Overwater 2 exactly the same way. That's what we did in this, this package in, in, our, in our PowerPoint here for today. So you know, here's here's overwater one with as narrow body one against the ILS. Same thing, overwater two. And okay. you can see that you just I'll, I'll click back and forth. So so this is the overwater two procedure. This is the overwater one procedure. So you you can just see like there's a little bit more green, you know, over the places where people are living. There's a little bit more purple over the water. Um, they both look like good concepts when you compare them to the ILS. And then when we look at how they stack up against, you know, the GLS uniform as an example, that's where we see that potentially the overwater two looks like a more compelling uh, procedure than one. So, um, you know, we, it's, it's our suggestion to change the CFPP. Another possibility is that we have um, two CFPPs. Uh, we have one that makes the comparison against the ILS and we have a second that makes the comparison against the GLS uniform. Well, the GLS, the GLS, we're not experiencing yet. Correct. And so you really have to wait until that is experiential to get really what's going to be on the ground. Mm -hmm. That's a true statement. Yeah. Okay. So we believe it might be more beneficial and simpler for, for to, to use this as, as the basis for comparison. We, we're prepared to make that change to our CFPPs this month. Very good. 
So th that was the primary information that I wanted to get through today. Um, again, just one more one more chance to take a look at this. And I, we've we've shown this graphic before, but I think it's a useful one. Um, Overwater one is is the path that kind of cuts here on the more left hand side of the screen. Overwater two is the more right hand one, and the line running right up the middle is the existing um, uh, is closer to the existing ILS approach, basically. So um, I, I just yes. Okay. Call for clarification. Did I understand that the reason that the um, overwater one um, is is somewhat to the left of the overwater two path due to the fact that you needed some space to get them turned once they get out in the middle of the day? Yep. So so that that's the reason for yeah yeah and we we it was it was one part of that and it was also because um, we were trying to find two different ways to get to get the aircraft out over the water. So overwater two is like the most aggressive path that you can take to get out over the water, but but it results in the aircraft flying over the meta headquarters essentially. Um, and and the other path is to try to stay within, you know, uh, well-tread um, paths. So over the overwater two path takes you essentially a little bit away from the RMP Yankee, a little bit um, into, into a new track. Um, but the overwater one stays within existing tracks. It basically that overwater 204 is like you were flying the tiptoe, um, if that makes so sense. Did you, could you make, not today, but some point um, overlay this with the ILS so that we could see how, how to line up with the current ILS? Yes, I apologize for not having that today. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and flying over the meta headquarters is a problem. Why? <laughs> well, I... <laughs> We, 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 I'm just pointing it out as a landmark. I'm not here to, to comment on. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not sure where that landmark is. So um, I, I just wondered what the reference was to that. My, my apologies. I, I, uh, I, I, I just know where it is because it's such a big facility. Uh, so I, uh, <laughs> where, you, where is it on it's, your map? It's, uh, let me, let me pull up a, actually, let's go to the website and I will. <laughs> I'll zoom it's in. on this side of the Dunbar <laughs> Bridge, right where the Dunbar Bridge empties at the University. <laughs> Wouldn't want to piss them off, right? Why not? No, it's, it's just a it's a fix. So I'm good. I'm just I've gone to our our uh, our GBAS landing page here on the noise.flysfo.com website, and I'm pulling up the uh, GIS portal. And I'm going to pause. I'm going to zoom in as best I can. It's, it's just rendering a little bit here. I'm gonna do this kind of two levels. So I apologize, but basically the meta headquarters is like right right in this area here where my cursor is kind of moving around. Okay. You can see the bridge. Yeah, I see, I see where the bridge right is. There. I just wasn't sure what the significance was. There is a little. <laughs> I don't yeah. know, they pack a little power. <laughs> okay. Uh, so th question. that's... Sorry, that's that's all the materials I had to share for today. So, so again, you know, our our proposal is to to update those comparisons here for the Group Two A CFPPs this month, if that's acceptable to to members of the roundtable TWG in particular. Um, the other thing that we are planning on doing um, is to try to keep up with the FA proposed changes to the GLS uniform. As I mentioned, there's some waypoint changes. They're very minor. We we think they're going to be beneficial because they're further away from. From human beings, we have those waypoints, so we'll we'll get those incorporated in a CFPP update just to honor our commitment to keep you all informed. Um, and there are some very minor tweaks to the GLS 10 right, 10 left that um, they won't change the noise calculation, or they shouldn't change the noise calculation. But we're just trying to be accurate, so we'll get those out there too. Um, and then it is still our goal to seek uh, feedback and, and approval from the roundtable um, by December of this year, if possible. But as I mentioned at the beginning, we are still getting suggested procedures. Um, so if we keep getting suggested procedures or if we find we need modifications and that that yields us needing more time, then then we'll we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Um, so we'll do our best to take those suggested procedures and turn around those that the flight procedure subcommittee feels have a chance at being published. Uh, Chair Hindi, that's what I had for, for today. Thank you, Paul. I'm going to open it for further questions from staff as well as members of the Rianti. I don't see any hands on Zoom from members of the round table. Okay, and you're good. I'm good. Very good. All right. Thank you. Let me go ahead. Thanks, Paul. Let me go ahead and open it to the public for questions if we have any, and then we'll get back with you as well. Yes, thank you, Chairman. We do have three hands raised, so I will first call on Charlene Yapley, followed by Mark Shaw. Okay. 
Yeah. Ms. Yapley? Thank you for creating the CFPPs in the discussion. The SEL noise metric is a compressed one second of noise over the duration of the noise event. I realize it's exciting to see purple and green and think we're gonna hear noticeable changes to the human ear. Please keep in mind the limitations of SEL as a metric. My understanding is that a three dB increase in SEL is quite small because it's divided over 30 seconds, which is the average length of the noise event. So three dB over 30 seconds would be 0.1 dB and not noticeable to the human ear. Technically, there may be increases or decreases in SEL, but what matters for all of us is if we can tell or not from the perspective of our own human ear. Can Paul SFO provide noise information using LMAX also? You are doing noise reports with LMAX. So for the CFPPs, not just SEL, also do LMAX who can truly understand the noise impact as, ex as experienced as a person on the ground. I concur with Ms. Wentworth's comment about doing actual impact noise baseline to understand before and after, and also for your SEL calculations if you could share the air bars. Regarding overwater one and overwater two, I didn't understand exactly why we're doing both. I originally thought overwater one would fly higher, higher and would be better. And I have to say, I was a little confused by the changes you introduced that weren't in the packet about GLS uniform um, as the basis. Regarding the down the bay proposal, how is this compared to down the bay innovative approach group one? Would be better to wait for the down the bay IA group one and compare the actual versus modeled before proposing another down the bay. Will one replace the other? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Yapley. I will now call on Mark Scholl, followed by Mary Jo Fremont. Thank you. San Francisco operates closely spaced parallel runways and modeling arrivals as individual arrivals is a start, but much of the excess noise over Palo Alto is the result of the rapid altitude and speed changes that are required when one arriving plane on one procedure has to be positioned relative to a second plane arriving on a second procedure. Palo Alto is where planes merge and make the late adjustments they need so they can land closely together. This late sequ sequencing of two planes creates significant amount of noise over what might be expected if each of the arrivals were modeled individually. In other words, individual modeling doesn't always capture the total noise because it's the, the sum plus whatever additional maneuvering is required to sequence two planes before they hit the intermediate fix. The second is arrivals off surfer fly under simultaneous arrivals off the bodega and pirate structures. These are typically separated only by a thousand feet vertically, and the surfer arrival often has to fly below the class B shelf at side by to be a thousand below Bodega private arrival and pirate arrival. So my question is, how can you raise arrivals off surfer and keep them under Bodega and pirate in any of the models? Now I realize at night, if there's nothing else that's possible, if you can get them to fly that procedure versus more direct, but that 99% of the time, that's what we experience. Lastly, the industry's plans for GLS at SFO include moving away from soil-like lateral separation in favor of .308 vertical stagger. In other words, the planes would land at different, uh, different uh, angles rather than uh, uh, separately. And I'm wondering where this stands because it's in all of the industry requests and I'm wondering, is this something we should anticipate in the future? Thank you. I will now call on the left hand raise, which is Mary Jo Fremont. Ms. Fremont? Yes, uh, thank you. So I wholeheartedly agree with the previous uh, two comments, uh, and especially about uh, Darlene on the SEL. Nobody can hear SEL. It's the total duration of, it's uh, the total noise of the noise event over its duration. Uh, SFO said they would report LMAX in the CFPPs. Do it, please do the same. Show us the SEL if you want, but show us the LMAX, the contours and so on. Furthermore, on the SEL, you're showing us contours of SEL at 50, 55, 60. I wish we had SEL contours of aircraft noise at 50. 
because that means I will never hear a plane. So when you are, I mean, you know that, Paul, it's, you know, if you have an L max, for instance, of 40 dB, you will be getting an SEL of probably 50, uh, 60 or something like this. Therefore, when you're showing SEL contours of 50 dB for aircraft noise, they don't exist. So you're counting populations. Yeah, they live there, but they don't experience aircraft noise at 50 dB. So I think it is really misleading as people are paying a lot of attention to the green and the purple, you're showing graphs that are really misleading because people are going to make decisions based on green versus purple. And these numbers are meaningless from a human experience on the ground. And you know that better than anybody else. Furthermore, you don't even have any error bar on this. So the two decimal points on the SML estimates, it's a fallacy. You know that as well. Your model spits out numbers with two, decim two, two decimals. I get that, but that's not really that. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Freeman. And with that, Chairman, we have no further hands raised for the time. Thank you, uh, Angela. Uh, Paul, um, I, if you have a few moments, kind of, if you're able to respond to those uh, three speakers or some of them, whatever you can. Well, I, I, yeah, I appreciate that. Um, and I, I was jotting down uh, as many of the comments. I think um, the, there, there are two, there's three things I'd like, I, I'd like to touch on in the time we have here today, just very quickly. And we'll, we'll do our best to also answer them more thoroughly on our Q&A section of the website. But um, the, the LMAX information, that's an excellent point, just, just to, just to uh, go on that one first. Um, we do have the LMAX information on the website, but not in the CFPPs. Um, uh, hearing the request, um, I, I will take that back with our team to discuss, you know, whether that's something that we can add in, uh, with our May update or whether that we'd have to do that separately. The challenge we have right now with LMAX just is, is really just one of, of scale of presentation in a CFPP. It's not that we didn't calculate it or we're not trying to show it. It is, it is online, um, for people to zoom in and out. But the, the challenge we have is that, um, most of the LMAX calculations we have are, to your point, they're, they're much smaller. Um, the calculated LMAXs are, are in a very concentrated area. Um, so so the, you know, one of the reasons why the team shows SEL in the first place is because it, it gives us a sense of how a small procedure change, like a couple hundred feet or a few knots here or there, might be affecting what the noise profile changes. But um, I, I, do, I do respectfully receive the comment about um, needing to include LMAX information. And, um, we have it on the web, so if we need to put it in the CFPP, I'll get with Bert and Nippur and Christian and, and see, you know, maybe we take another stab at, at trying to get that in that package as well. Um, the other one that I wanted to touch on was the DOT 308. Um, again, just, you know, excellent questions and comments from all of our, our participants, both on the roundtables, TVG, and, and, uh, and comments from the public. Um, the DOT 308, um, so we are working with the FA right now um, in, I believe the update is coming in August to hopefully enable the overlay GLS procedures, the, the ones that are identical to the ILS, to be um, included in the DOT 308 program at SFO, both for 2A left and 2A right and for 19 left and 19 right. And as part of our strategic vision, um, we have to, you know, we always have to start with things that are very familiar, things that you know, air traffic is used to, things that the aircraft are used to, et cetera. So we're, our goal is to start there and make sure that all of our stakeholders have a positive experience using GLS in the DOT 308 operation when it occurs, which will then in the future set us up for opportunities to explore using the GBAS for more of its capabilities, maybe, maybe. Um, with, again, we have to do this through the FA and our subcommittees and all that kind of stuff, but to, to look at things like um, using higher angles between the two runways that the GBAS can enable that an ILS can't enable, um, or to explore um, in the in the future in the future um, the possibility of, uh, of of having virtual display thresholds or second touchdown points on the runways because that would in principle achieve more opportunities for noise reduction and it might still maintain the right air, air traffic separation. That is a future concept. It is, it is not a group 2A concept, it's further out. We have that in our group three strategic vision. So, but I did wanna point out that coming in, in August, it is, our, it is our 
hope that we've been working with the FA that we will see GLS introduced into the dot 308 at that time. And that will be our opportunity to kind of move forward. So I wanted to, I just wanted to touch on those two. There were some other great questions raised, but I'd like to take them back with the team and, and answer them on our GS Q and A section if possible. Well, I appreciate that you taking the time and being able to respond to those comments to the best of your ability now. And we look forward to your answers and more details when you have them ready for us. Thank you. Any further speakers? No, no. Okay. With that, Paul, thank you so much. Uh, this uh, definitely was helpful to me. I wish we had more time to continue this discussion, but it has been a very uh, fruitful discussion from my perspective. I appreciate everyone's attendance. Thank you again for really breaking this down to us. Uh, I could look at it now in a better way and get a better understanding of it. So I really appreciate that. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, Angela and everybody. With us, I apologize for running behind, but I think it was time well used. Thank you. Thank you. With that, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks. Stay safe.